on you as soon as we can get to the review session. So, um, those are the, the steps that occur in uh, the catalytic action of serine proteases. And you'll notice I said serine protease. I gave you the specific example of chymotrypsin. But in fact, virtually every serine protease uses an identical mechanism. Virtually every one uses an identical mechanism. If we look at, uh, for example, the um, uh, configuration, the catalytic triad of a related serine protease and a subtle isom, what do we see? We see that subtle isom uses serine, and histidine, and aspartic acid. They have different numbers because it, it is a different enzyme. But the geometry of these is virtually identical to what we saw in chymotrypsin. You can also see the adjacent oxyanion hole, and uh, it's basically just a little chamber there that uh, stabilizes this overall um, rea otherwise reactive intermediate. Okay? But suffice it to say that subtle isom is a serine protease and uses an alkoxide ion that forms in a very, very similar fashion to what chymotrypsin does. And you might look at this and start wondering, well, why do you have these different enzymes that are, um, in fact, all working in the same way? Why don't you just have one enzyme? And the answer to that question is that enzymes differ from each other in the substrates that they bind. Okay? It's useful for us to have different enzymes to break down proteins. For example, we have an enzyme that breaks down, like chymotrypsin does, things that fairly nonpolar side chains like phenylalanine and methionine and so forth. They'll give us some specific sized pieces of polypeptide chains, but we really would like to break them down all the way. So if we have other amino acids that can, for example, bind to other uh, substrates and do the same type of cleavage, we can break the proteins further down into their substituent uh, amino acids. Now, what I want to show you here is something that uh, illustrates this, I think, quite um, specifically, and that is this, this figure right here, which I happen to like uh, a lot. It shows three different serine proteases. Here's one on the left, the one I've been talking about, kind of trypsin. One in the middle is trypsin, and the one on the right is elastase. They're all serine proteases. And these three serine proteases have shown at the bottom their S1 pockets. So again, it's just a little pocket in that active side of the enzyme. It's a place where the substrate binds. We look at the, in chymotrypsin, we see that the pocket is a fairly nonpolar structure, and it's reasonably large, so it can accommodate things like a ring of a phenylalanine. The ring of the phenylalanine actually sticks down into this site. And because nonpolars like nonpolar substances, they associate with each other very nicely. And this is the clue to the enzyme that, oh, the right thing has bound, and the enzyme goes about and does its business. By contrast, we saw another enzyme um, earlier, um, trypsin. And if you recall from the specificity of trypsin, you saw that trypsin cut next to lysine and arginine residues. If we look at the S1 pocket of trypsin, what do we see? Well, at the very bottom of it, there's a negatively charged aspartic acid residue. Let's think about what the side chains of lysine and arginine look like at physiological pH. They both have, like, they both have positively charged side chains. So the positively charged side chain is attracted to the negative here. If I try to put an aspartic acid in here, it ain't going to go because they're going to repel each other. And this would be a clue that the wrong substrate was there. If lysine or arginine binds, the right substrate will have bound. So the enzyme is using chemical information as a way of telling it, has it bound to a substrate or not? The last days uh, takes a, a further variation on this theme. That elastase cuts frequently next to alanines. Alanine has, a, if you recall, only a methyl group side chain. That methyl group side chain is relatively nonpolar, but it's not very big. And that's very good because this thing has things blocking the S1 pocket. So big nonpolars can't fit down here. So through very subtle changes in the configuration of the active site of these enzymes, the cell is able to define specificities for cutting a variety of different polypeptide chains. And we can see how this very simple thing now determines what um, 
is uh, what, what polypeptide or what portion of a polypeptide is where the cleavage occurs. Now, if I haven't already hit it home for you enough, I'll do it again. And that is to show you something here that uh, is a little hard to see at first glance, but you will, uh, I, I think, understand as I explain it. What you see projected on the screen are the structures, approximate 3D structures, of chymotrypsin and trypsin. And they're projected into their 3D configurations, one's in blue and one's in red. And what's interesting in looking at these is not so much the difference, but more so the over the places where they overlap. There is a lot of overlap. And even in places where they don't exactly overlap, like let's say right here, they have similarity of structure. Very, very similar structures all the way through this thing. There's a little bit of variation down here, but not much. Okay? What we see is, in fact, the places where the structures are the most conserved, that is where there's very, very little fun, very, very little difference, but the places where the active site is. So what a projection like this tells us, it reminds us, once again, the structure is necessary for function. Once cells have evolved a structure that works for them, hey, they're not against using it again and again and again, with slight variations on theme to change perhaps how the active site of the enzyme is recognized, perhaps a slightly different catalytic mechanism. But the structure is the, ul the ultimate important thing here. So this is a very good demonstration of this. There are other examples I could show you, but that's one of the best ones right there. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see, because I want to talk about this. Here is um, uh, another serine protease. We see aspartic acid, we see histidine, we see serine, we see a common theme that's occurring now. We also see over here an oxyanion hole, which is a place to stabilize that reactive intermediate. Okay. And let's see. This uh, is an interesting experiment that people did, and I'm going to describe the experiment to you. Uh, uh, to sort of drive this point home again. The question arose, well, we've got a catalytic triad. What, which of the amino acids in this catalytic triad plays the most important role? Okay. Which one plays the most important role? Or perhaps more importantly, which plays the least important role? Well, how would you study that? How would you determine that? Well, with modern genetic technique, we can actually uh, uh, design proteins at will. So somebody took and they said, well, let's take uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, serine protease and let's mutate the serine to an alanine and see the effect this would have. Well, of course, if we mutate a serine to an alanine, we change a hydroxide to a methyl group. Chemically, that's very different, but that's the only change that was made in the protein. If we do such an experiment and we compare the activity of the wild type to the activity of the mutant, we see that the activity goes down by seven orders of magnitude. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Seven orders of magnitude means that this guy right here is one ten millionth as active as the wild type. That's not totally surprising. Why is it not totally surprising? Well, think about it. That serine had the hydroxyl, it had the alkoxide ion, and that alkoxide ion was pretty important for catalyzing this reaction. You might say, why doesn't it go to zero? Well, we've got an electronic environment in here. We have to keep in mind that that electronic environment is part of the overall action of the protein. So perhaps there's some compensation that can allow for a very tiny amount. Believe me, this is a very tiny amount of activity. Well, what if instead of mutating serine to alanine, we took the histidine that's in the middle of the catalytic triad and we mutated it to alanine? Well, not surprisingly, we saw again seven order of magnitude uh, change, but we still saw a little bit of activity. And that tells us again that we had some compensation going on. But most importantly, we saw that loss of the histidine side chain was every bit as detrimental as the loss of the serine side chain. Okay, so we've done two of them. We go to the third one. D stands for aspartic acid. When we mutate aspartic acid to an alanine, 
we see we now get about five and a half to six orders of magnitude change. But of the three of these, the one that was the least important was the aspartic acid. Now, that will become slightly important when I show you a couple of the catalytic mechanisms later. The aspartic acid is important, but it's not as important as the other two. Last, if we mutated all three of these guys, we saw an activity that was not unlike if we mutated either one of these, seven order magnitude change. What if we didn't use an enzyme at all? Well, that's how much activity we see, and it's about two or three orders of magnitude lower. Okay, so experiments like this tell us the relative contribution of the individual amino acids in a catalytic mechanism. Let's look at some other proteases now. Okay. Here is uh, the active site of an enzyme known as papain. It comes from papaya. Papain is a protease. And when we look at its active site, we see that it has a cysteine and a histidine. There's that histidine again. Cysteine, not surprisingly, has an SH group. And we can start to imagine in our head that that SH group might behave very much like an OH group did in the serine proteases. And as we shall see, that's in fact exactly what happens. Okay? There's one. Here is another. Uh, oh, what did I just do? Here's another uh, protease that we um, talk about Renin. Renin is an example of an aspartate protease. And we'll see that even though it looks like it has a very different mechanism, we're going to see that there are some common features that it has with the serine proteases. This guy has two aspartic acid residues present in its active site. And we'll see how they work together to help to um, uh, catalyze the reaction. And here is yet another uh, category of enzymes. It's important to know as metalloproteases. And metalloproteases work with a zinc, as we shall see. You see some histidines there, and the histidines do play a role, not one I'm going to say much about. But the zinc turns out to be very important. And again, we're going to see some relationship to the serine proteases. So by understanding the mechanism of the serine proteases, I hope to convince you that you can understand the mechanisms of these very diverse sets of enzymes coming up. All right. Well, let's start with the cysteine protease. The cysteine protease was papain, and uh, papain was um, it, the one that had the um, um, sulfhydryl. It had the cysteine side chain, and it had a histidine. Let's think about what might happen with this enzyme. We've got these two guys in close proximity. The proper substrate binds in the S1 pocket. And yes, they'll have the equivalent of an S1 pocket. The proper substrate binds, the enzyme changes shape slightly. When it changes shape slightly, this histidine side chain, which is relatively electron rich, comes close to the hydrogen on the sulfur, and it pulls it off, just like we saw in the serine proteases. When it pulls it off, it leaves behind its electrons behind. So now the sulfur is negatively charged. And the sulfur is a nucleophile, just like the oxygen was in the um, alkoxide ion. And it attacks this carbon, just like we saw before. And those same basic steps that I described to you before happen here. We see the formation of a covalent bond. We have a fast reaction. It cleaves the bond. We have a slow reaction that involves the release of the other half of the polypeptide chain from that sulfur bond. And we go back and we regenerate the sulfhydryl. So cysteine proteases, in general, will, in fact, uh, have a very, very similar mechanism to serine proteases. We don't see the third member of the triad. That was the one that we decided was the least important one before, and that was aspartic acid. So serine, cysteine proteases have dispensed of a need for the third one, and they still catalyze reactions just fine. If we look at the aspartyl proteases, the example of which I showed you was renin. Renin has, at its active site, two aspartic acid side chains. Now, this one looks a little bit more complicated, but it turns out it's not as complicated as you might think. Here, 
are these two aspartic acid residues. Okay? We see a bunch of hydrogen bonding going on in this active site. There's a hydrogen bond between a hydrogen bond between this oxygen and one of the hydrogens of water. And water is going to play a very active role here. And we see another hydrogen bond between this um, uh, uh, oxygen and this uh, proton that just that, that is a side chain of the aspartic acid. Okay. People say, well, does it matter if the proton's here or the proton's here? Spatially, it does, but we haven't distinguished which one has the proton, so we don't really have to worry about that for our purposes. The important thing that happens is when the proper substrate binds, this geometry is set up so that this guy actually gets closer to this water molecule, and guess what it does? It pulls the proton off. And what does that leave behind? It leaves a reactive hydroxyl, and that reactive hydroxyl has an extra electron. It goes looking for a nucleophile. It finds the nucleophile right there in the form of a carbon. It cleaves the polypeptide bond, and this guy goes flying away. But there's a fundamental difference here. We saw the nucleophile, we saw the uh, activated oxygen atom that was there, but there's a fundamental difference in the mechanism of this guy compared to the serine proteases. It's not the, the catalytic triad. What is the fundamental difference between this and the mechanism I showed you before? Any Mm, no, not going to do that. What happened in the serine protease? We had, we had two steps, right? The first step involved what? The cleavage by an alkoxide ion. And what did that cleavage result in? Covalent bond between the enzyme and the polypeptide chain. Are we going to form a covalent bond here? The molecule doing the attacking is water, the hydroxide of water. It's not the side chain of an amino acid. When the side chain of an amino acid attacked, it became attached to the polypeptide chain. When water attacks, it will become attached, but the water is not attached to the enzyme. When this guy cleaves, we would predict it would not have a fast phase and a slow phase. It would only have one phase, because once the hydroxide attacks, it splits the polypeptide in two, the way we thought originally that the serine the serine protease work, but it doesn't. This one's fundamentally different. Okay. Now let's look at one that again on the surface looks like it's very different, but in fact we'll say it's not that different overall. This is an example of a metalloprotease. The metalloprotease, as its name suggests, uses a metal ion as part of its catalytic process. The most commonly used metal ion is zinc. And you see it depicted here. The zinc is held in place to the rest of the enzyme by histidines. Here's our friend histidine. Histidine seems to be involved in everything, doesn't it? Okay. Now, this step is a little bit more ambiguous than we saw before, but you see this letter B on the side. The B stands for the, the, the clever way of calling it a base. So this is going to vary from one enzyme to another. We don't have one thing that's there, like a histidine or something like that. We have something that acts as a base, and that base is abstracting a proton off of water. So the binding of the proper substrate gets the geometry right such that this B molecule pulls off a proton of water. We're left behind again with electrons on a hydroxide. The hydroxide is reactive. It attacks the carbon of the peptide bond. And again, we see cleavage of the peptide bond and the release of the two substrates. Okay. So, the common theme you've seen now in all of these is that we create a reactive molecule. Whether that reactive molecule was oxygen, in the case of the alkoxide ion, or in the case of the water, or the molecule was a sulfur, as in the case of cysteine proteases. In each case, that reactive molecule was a nucleophile. It attacked the carbon of the peptide bond and resulted ultimately 
and everything falling apart. Okay. Now, um, I'm not quite sure why your book puts this here, but I'm going to put it here because your book puts it here. Um, this depicts the um, structure of an protease uh, for human health, known as the HIV protease. And HIV, of course, we all know what HIV is. Um, I guess the reason I put this here is to remind us of the importance of structure and function. Not surprisingly, the proteins of HIV are very intensely studied so that we can have uh, understandings of the mechanism by which they work, and in many cases to design drugs um, that prevent them from functioning. We hear about the various treatments that uh, have been designed for HIV, and there are many different strategies for designing drugs against HIV, but one of them is to make inhibitors of HIV's protease. So HIV has its own protease, and the protease uh, plays a role in the actual cutting of the uh, polypeptides used to make the protein coat of the virus. Okay. The protease is involved in that. If we can inhibit the protease from making the proper cuts on the protein coat of the virus, the virus can't assemble its coat and therefore can't be infectious. So one of the strategies is designing things that inhibit that. So this is simply showing uh, that here is the uh, protease, it's a dimer, meaning it has two identical subunits, kind of like we saw in uh, other uh, proteins that we talked about. And the knowledge of the structure led to the design of protease inhibitors that knocked this protease out and prevented it from functioning. Okay, here's the inhibitor if you want to memorize the structure. But I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, and here's the, you put the two guys together, and that's what it looks like. I find that textbooks get overly enamored with structure, and I look at that and think, what does that tell me? I'm not sure what that tells me. I had a student one time that came to me and said, the structure is so important, and you downplay it all the time. I said, well, okay, what did that, what did that tell me? Structure is important. Well, that's what I said, structure is important. Okay. But, hey, anyway, I'm not going to go through uh, individual details of that structure. Okay. Now, uh, let us uh, now turn our attention to a class of, uh, to another enzyme that we've been talking about in class. It's not a serine protease. It's not a protease at all. There are, of course, thousands of enzymes in the cell that have nothing to do with proteolytic activity. From all the talking about them I've been doing, you would think that the only enzymes that the cell has are proteases, and that's obviously not the case. One of those enzymes is carbonic anhydrase, and carbonic anhydrase um, as I talked about yesterday, is a pretty remarkable enzyme. It's almost magical in being able to catalyze reactions as rapidly as it does. So it's useful for us to have an understanding about the way in which carbonic anhydrase works. Let's um, spend a minute reminding ourselves of the reaction. Here is the reaction we've seen now, but, but the third time this term, carbon dioxide plus water, goes to carbonic acid, and that in turn can ionize the bicarbonate ion, giving up a proton. Okay. We see this um, unusual scheme that's here for the right arrows and the left arrows, and it's kind of like the equilibrium that we saw before, but you see that the K1 has a shorter arrow than the K minus 1 does. Uh, and in this case, it's telling us that the uh, reaction in the forward direction has a smaller uh, equilibrium, or smaller rate constant than does the reverse reaction. So in this particular case, the reverse reaction would actually be favored to go back in this direction. Well, this enzyme is interesting uh, because if we look at this enzyme and we study its um, kinetics, um, we discover something very interesting with respect to pH. Look at this enzyme. This enzyme has, uh, it exists in the body at physiological pH. And the physiological pH, you see KCAT is changing, and you're going, but you said KCAT's a constant. Well, KCAT's a constant at you know, the body conditions that we look at. If we start changing those conditions, you might imagine we're going to change the enzyme, and we're actually going to change KCAT. So KCAT can change as we change conditions for a given enzyme, but we don't typically do that. But this is an enzyme that we're interested in studying, and so this person measured the KCAT of the enzyme at various pHs. They started at a pH below that of the human body, which is uh, pH 6, and they raised it all the way up to pH 9. And amazingly, 
the most active pH for this enzyme was not physiological pH. It was the physiological pH. We were at roughly uh, a KCAT about, about right here, 700, 800,000, which is about what we talked about yesterday. It's one of the reasons we saw that variation in that number from different places. But the maximum activity of this enzyme was the pH 9. Well, normally cells evolve enzymes uh, to be optimally active at the pH at which they're normally used. Here's an enzyme that didn't have that property. And in fact, it was better at pH 9 than it was at physiological pH. So this was a clue that there was something interesting about the mechanism of this enzyme that we really needed to understand better. So I'm going to spend a minute or two talking about the way in which this enzyme works. Okay? So... Um, it turns out that carbonic anhydrase also, like a, cysteine, like a metalloprotease, uses zinc as part of its catalytic action. And specifically, it uses zinc as a way of holding on to water. You can see that happening right here. Now, as we're going to see in the mechanism that's, that this enzyme uses uh, in a minute, one of the critical steps in the activation of this enzyme, and I'm sorry, act activation in the activity of this enzyme, I can say the word. One of the critical steps in the activity of this enzyme is creating, here we go again, a reactive hydroxyl. You have to get that, that, that proton off of there. Well, it turns out there's several ways to get that proton off of there, but if we don't have other means available to us, we have to simply wait for that proton to come off in the physiological environment of water. Well, that, re that reaction does not occur very readily. We don't see protons just coming off of water very fast. We, in fact, the uh, rate constant for that's about, about 10, to the the 10 to the minus 7, which is uh, the, the, the reciprocal of what we have there. Oh, what did I just do? Right? Meaning that if we're simply waiting for carbonic acid, okay. You know what it tells you is you can't do random tapping. There we go. There's that. There. There. Okay. Um, that if we're waiting simply for that proton to come off, we're going to wait a long time. Okay. Well, let's look at the mechanism. The mechanism is shown right here. We see that in the carbonic anhydrase reaction, we have to first of all make a reactive hydroxyl that involves loss of a proton. That reactive hydroxyl combines with a, with a, seen this before, attacking the carbon, which is a relatively electron poor because the oxygens are pulling electrons away here. This nucleophilic attack that we see here results in the formation of this bicarbonate intermediate. The bicarbonate gets released, and we're back where we started. Now, why is this guy more active at pH 9 than it is at physiological pH? Well, at pH 9, this proton is much more likely to come off. It's simple chemistry. So instead of having to wait a longer period of time for the proton to come off at pH 9, and we're much more likely to have hydroxyls, we're much more likely to see that proton come off, and as a consequence, this reaction <coughs> excuse me, proceeds more rapidly. So the reason that this um, enzyme is better at pH 9 has nothing to do with the evolution of the enzyme. It has to do with the chemistry of the aqueous environment in which this um, enzyme works. Um, questions about that? I know the answer to that before I ask the question. Everyone want to take a stretch? Maybe we can use a stretch at this point. Oh, yeah. I'm so stressing, I can tell you a joke. Would you like a joke? Yeah. Okay. So, this is one of my favorite jokes. Um, there's this little guy that says he wants to be a hitman. Okay? His name's Artie. Okay? And so, he looks around and figures, you know, everything out in the world, if you want to get started something, you've got to start at a reduced price and get it out there. You know? You give away your software for free and people use it and they pay you for it later. 
So he figures, okay, I'm going to start as a hitman. I'm going to, you know, just charge a real low price, get, kind of get my foot in the door and get started. I'll get a reputation, and then I'll be able to be a very successful hitman. So Artie goes, he does this, and uh, he posts post sign over the neighbor signs over the neighborhood says, "We'll kill anyone for for a dollar." So he's got his little phone number on there, and this guy's walking home, and he sees him, he goes, oh. So he grabs it and takes it home, and calls up Artie, and he says, uh, you're killing one for a dollar. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, why, why so cheap? Well, I'm just getting started, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, that's good. He says, who do you want me to kill? And the guy says, well, I want you to kill my wife. And he says, okay. He says, so I'll do that. Uh, when do you want me to kill her? And he said, well, how about right now? Okay, I'm not busy. That's fine. Where's she at? Well, she's down at the grocery store right now. Uh, buying groceries. Can you go down there? So he gives him directions to the grocery store, gives him a description of her and everything. And Artie goes trucking down to the grocery store. And he looks around the grocery store, and there's not hardly anybody there. And all of a sudden he sees, oh, there she is. And she's back there in the produce section. You know? And so he sneaks up and he tiptoes behind her and he grabs her and strangles her right there in the grocery store. Dead. Okay? He's feeling pretty good, right? And he's going to make his reputation. He looks around. Oh, damn, somebody saw him. You know? So he turns around, he goes around, he's kind of a witness, so he grabs this person and he strangles this person right there in the grocery store. Now he's got, oh shit, there's a third one over here, okay? So he goes, he grabs them, he strangles them, he gets out of the grocery store as quickly as he can, he goes running down the street to get away so he doesn't get in any more trouble and he gets arrested. And the headline of the newspaper the next day says, Artie Chokes Three for a Dollar at the Grocery Store. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite sad, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, good old Artie. <laughs> All right, moving to less fun things than that. <laughs> Let us talk about um, restriction enzymes. Okay, what I'm going to do is talk about restriction enzymes uh, briefly, and uh, I may say a word or two about nucleoside monophosphate kinases, and then I will stop. But I, I'm not going to do a whole lot more. We're in pretty good shape with stuff. So, restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes um, are going to be a little harder to understand, um, but I hope that by the time I finish talking about them that you'll see that, again, we are making a reactive intermediate. That reactive intermediate is acting as a nucleophile, and that nucleophile is helping to catalyze the reaction that we're doing. Okay? Well, what's a restriction enzyme, first of all? A restriction enzyme uh, is also called a restriction endonuclease. You don't need to know that. But a restriction enzyme is an enzyme that binds to DNA. It recognizes a specific sequence of bases, and it cuts the DNA at that point. So it binds to DNA. It recognizes a specific sequence of bases, and it cuts DNA. So we can think of a restriction enzyme as the sort of DNA equivalent of a protease. Now, restriction enzymes are not found in human beings. They're not found in our digestive system, for example. We don't use restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes turn out, turn out to be confined to bacteria. Bacteria use restriction enzymes as a defense mechanism. Now, I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about how they use it and why they use it before I talk about the mechanism itself. Okay. So, why do bacteria use an enzyme to cut DNA as a defense mechanism. Let's imagine that I am a bacterium. I'm floating around, and there are all kinds of viruses out there that could come in and invade and infect me. And yes, viruses do infect bacteria. They're called bacteriophages. Well, a human being or a higher order organism, there's an immune system that protects you from viruses. It's not perfect, but it does a pretty darn good job of protecting you against viruses. Antibodies binding, the, the, the various killer responses come along and uh, prevent the um, uh, infection from getting worse. Okay? A bacterium is a cell on, all on its own. It doesn't have any other things to make things for it. It's got to have its own protection within itself. That's the protection that it has within itself are restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes, as I said, recognize specific DNA sequences and cut right there. They actually break phosphodiester bonds. That's the backbone of DNA, phosphodiester bonds. Right? Well, that's great. If a virus decides to infect that bacterial cell, the virus injects its DNA into the cell, 
and the, the uh, restriction enzyme comes along and cuts the virus up into pieces, and the virus is dead. But wait, there's a problem. The problem is the cell also has DNA, and if it starts cutting itself up, it won't be alive for very long. So the cell has to have a way of protecting its own DNA while cutting foreign DNAs. And so it turns out the restriction enzymes in bacterial cells are paired with another enzyme called a methylase. M-E-T-H-Y-L-A-S-E. The bacterial cells have both a restriction enzyme and an equivalent methylase. The methylase recognizes exactly the same sequence that the restriction enzyme does, but instead of cutting it, it puts a methyl group on one of the bases in the sequence. So if we look, um, for example, of a place where this occurs, this is the recognition sequence for an enzyme known as ECOR5. ECOR5 recognizes and cuts at GATATC. The methylase that the bacterium has for this recognizes GATATC and it puts a methyl group on that A right there. Okay? The addition of that methyl group prevents that DNA from being cut. Now, the cellular DNA, as it's being made, gets methylated, and because it gets methylated, the restriction enzyme can't cut it. The invading DNA coming from a virus isn't methylated. It's got GATATC sequences. The restriction enzyme cuts it, and the cell is protected. Is it a perfect system? No. There's no protection system that's perfect. We can imagine, well, what happens if the methylase gets to the um, invading DNA before the restriction enzyme does? The answer is that viral DNA will be protected, and that cell is host. But for the most part, that doesn't happen. For the most part, the restriction enzyme makes it there first. It cuts up the DNA, and as a consequence, that um, cell is protected from the invasion of that virus. Now, I had to tell you that so that we could, you could understand a little bit about what's happening in the mechanism of action of a restriction in the nucleus. Okay? So I'm not going to focus on the methylase. I'm going to focus on the restriction in the nucleus. Restriction in the nucleus um, actually uses water to cleave phosphodiester bond. The phosphodiester bond is the bond between the phosphate and the deoxyribose in the DNA backbone. You see it right here. You see the addition of water, and you see the cleavage of that. So the phosphate that was here is now down over here. The other base that was here was the one that was up over here. We've broken this bond right here. All right. So as a consequence of that, we put a split in the DNA. If we have a double-stranded DNA, we do this on each strand so that we make a complete break in the DNA. We've broken both strands as a result of action of this enzyme. So this is what the enzyme is actually catalyzing. Notice the water, and the water is going to play a very important role in this process. Okay. Now, um, I don't want to talk about that. That's not what I want either. I'm not doing very well here. Okay. It turns out that restriction enzymes, and this looks a little complicated, so what we're, we're looking at is up close and personal at the place where the reaction is being catalyzed in the active site of this enzyme. In order for, for the enzyme to catalyze the um, uh, breakage of the phosphodiester bond in DNA, the restriction endonuclease has to, first of all, recognize a GATATC. So there's the equivalent step that we saw in the serine protease. The proper substrate will have the sequence GATATC. We can see in this figure the place where the bond is going to be broken, and we're not going to look at that any closer, I have to say. But the thing I want to point out to you is that very close to the place where that bond is going to be cleaved, there's a magnesium ion. 
Magnesium plays a very important role in the catalytic action of this enzyme. Okay. All right. So there's our GAT, ATC. It turns out it's a symmetric sequence. It goes on the other strand. Look at that, GAT, ATC. All we have to do is cut right through here, and we cut both strands. That's what we see or actually happening over here. All right. Well, how does this thing occur? I told you that it had to recognize that proper um, uh, substrate um, GAT, ATC. And when the proper substrate binds, we see that not only does the protein sit on the DNA, but when the proper GAT, ATC binds, the DNA gets bent by the enzyme. And it gets bent because the shape of the enzyme changes on the proper binding of the proper substrate. This is a pretty pronounced change. So the shape of the DNA is actually bent, and the middle of that bent is where that bond is going to be broken. Okay? So the middle is where that bond is going to be broken. We can see right inside of this guy that the bond is going to be broken right in here. Right? Now, the magnesium ion that I was describing before is located down in this area. And right above the magnesium ion, is a water. Okay. What the magnesium ion does is it actually stimulates the activation of the water, and it's a little bit different mechanism than what I've talked about before, but it stimulates the activation of the water to make an active hydroxyl, and the active hydroxyl is a nucleophile and attacks that center sequence of the GAT ATC. So the activation of the water by the magnesium causes the, um, um, I can't say it, causes the, the uh, activated hydroxyl to attack the phosphodiester bond. The phosphodiester bond is broken as a result, and this, these two pieces are released. So what's the key steps here? Number one key step is that the proper substrate has to be recognized and bound. When it's bound, the enzyme changes shape and we get a bend. The bend allows the entry of a, oops, there we go allows the entry of the magnesium and the water so that the water can be activated to attack that bond. Well, what happens with the methyl group that I talked about? When the methyl group is present on the DNA, the enzyme cannot recognize it as the proper substrate. So it goes sliding along and it doesn't even see it as the proper, subst as the proper substrate and it doesn't bend it. No bending, no magnesium, no water, no cutting. On the other hand, if there's no methyl group there, recognizes, bends, activates, cuts. Okay? So it's again an example of the binding of the proper substrate and the proper substrate causing conformational changes that result in the catalytic activity that we saw before. That's not a very good one. There's, again, we're trying to look at it sort of longitudinally, and that's not a very good figure. We see common themes when we look at different restriction enzymes. We see that, again, structure is conserved. Unfortunately, I don't think this figures, these figures are very good illustrations of that, but uh, suffice it to say that there are similarities in the placement and location of those magnesiums in different restriction enzymes for cutting and recognizing different sequences, kind of like we had for different uh, sequences of polypeptides in proteases. But again, conservation of structure is very important. And there's yet another example. There are hundreds of restriction enzymes that are available, and you can actually buy them commercially uh, to use in your laboratory to uh, cleave DNAs. Okay, now, the last one, why don't I just finish it off and then we'll be done with this and we'll, we'll go on. Okay, so the last one I'll tell you is very brief, and it's not an example of a mechanism. I'm not going to talk about the mechanism much here. This is an example of a class of enzymes known as NMP. Kinases. We'll talk a little bit more about them later. NMP kinases are very important in nucleotide metabolism. That is, the chemical reactions that give rise to nucleotides. The reactions they catalyze are like what we see here. NMP, N stands for any, 
nucleoside monophosphate. So we can have AMP, we can have GMP, we can have CMP, we can have UMP. Any of these would work for right here. Well, M stands for monophosphate, so you'll see this guy only has one phosphate. These enzymes catalyze the transfer of a phosphate from ATP onto the NMP to make an NDP. Now it's a diphosphate. So what's happening basically is that this phosphate is hopping from here over to here. Okay. Now, I'm not going to talk about the mechanism of releasing that phosphate so far because that's not the important thing here. The important thing is that that phosphate is moving from one side to the other. Here are some examples of NMP kinases. These are classes of enzymes. There's adenylate kinase. It works on AMP. There's guanylate kinase. It works on GMP. Okay. Now, there are some similarities of structure. I don't think there's an awful lot that you can see there, but you get an idea uh, that there is some similarity between the two in terms of overall structure. Now, the important thing about these kinases is that when they catalyze the reaction, that phosphate that moves from one side to the other would really love to get released out to water. It's completely soluble in water. And if the enzyme is not careful, what happens when it cuts the phosphate off of the um, ATP, if it doesn't make it go over to the NMP, the phosphate goes out into water and then everything is lost. All that the enzyme has done is it's cleaved ATP and it's lost the phosphate, it's lost energy, and it hasn't made what it wanted to make, which was a diphosphate. Well, these guys, and as you come back to the structure here, these guys do have a common feature that we can see up here. See this guy up here, and you see this guy up here. What they have is the equivalent of a lid. Okay? A lid. So what this enzyme does, it binds both substrates, and the binding of both substrates causes the lid to close. But if you close the lid, guess what? The phosphate can't escape. You increase the likelihood the phosphate will end up on the thing you want it onto instead of escaping out into the solution. So this change in structure, this closing of the lid, is a fairly drastic structure, structural change in this enzyme, and it happens for the same reason we've seen every other one happen before. Binding of the proper substrate causes the lid to close. So once again, we keep coming back to this theme, we see that the flexibility of enzymes really helps enzymes to perform the function that they need to form. NMP kinases are a prime example of that. Okay? A prime example. As a consequence, they're much more efficient than if there's no lid and allows the phosphate to escape. Okay, now that's a lot of material. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. But I thought at that point we can stop. We're actually in good shape. We can actually have the exam tomorrow. We've gotten through the material that I wanted to get through. And we can um, do that. So what I'd like to do now is take maybe a one or two minute break while I uh, fix up the camera and stop uh, or tell the camera that we're going to do, do a review session. And we're set. So if you want to leave, that's fine. If you want to stay, that's fine. Do you want to do a song? Or do you want to do the review session? I don't care. Review? Okay. That's, fine. That's kind of my inclination, too. The sooner we get it done, the better. Okay. Let me get by you here. Sorry. I should have gone the other side. Sorry. I just want to make sure.